Thank you so much for having me. Um, I actually did do my PEDS rotation here during medical school, so I was here a long time ago also. So some maybe, I don't know if people recognize me, but it's good to be back. Um, so thank you all for having me. And yes, my talk today will be about pediatric allergy with a focus on allergic rhinitis, um, as that's primarily what I help manage, um, but just you know, kind of touching on all parts of allergy. Um, so allergic rhinitis is really something that has implications in a lot of other medical problems that kids have. Um, we know that it can be a sign of something else and it, is, it has a lot of other concomitant comorbid symptoms and diagnoses um, in children. One thing, and so these are things that I always try to ask about whenever I have a kid coming in with a runny nose or a stuffy nose. Um, Primarily, you know, atopic dermatitis, eczema, asthma, allergies, those things always tend to run together, and we'll talk about that in a little bit um, more detail. I always ask about sinusitis and sinus infections, because obviously having chronic congestion in the nose can ultimately lead you to go on to have more formal infection. Um, chronic cough is actually something that is common in kids with allergies. Sometimes it's their presenting symptom, like dry, persistent cough. So if a kid has allergic rhinitis, I also ask about chronic cough. Chronic cough can then also lead to like chronic throat irritation and laryngitis and things like that. So um, those things kind of also lump together. And then sleep disordered breathing. I know that's something that most of us screen for all the time, um, but if you can't breathe out your nose, most likely you're gonna have some issue with your sleeping too. So um, I try to touch on all of these every time I see somebody coming in. And it, I think it's just a good reminder that allergic rhinitis does sort of reach into multiple different aspects of what, um, what kids may have. So this is something that I think we're all familiar with or have seen at some point. Um, it is the atopic march or the allergic march. And it's just trying to show how different parts of allergy manifest over time across different age groups. Um, so in infancy and you know under age one, the most common thing kids will have is skin conditions. So um, atopic dermatitis, eczema, hives, dry skin, things like that. That tends to be what happens first. Um, soon thereafter, around age one, they start. The most common thing next to happen is food allergy. Um, it's not as common to have the formal allergic rhinitis that early on. Um, so early, early, it's atopic dermatitis and food-related allergies. Allergic asthma does sort of start to take off, you know, a little bit around that time too, age one, but really starts to hit its stride around, you know, between four and five, around age three. And then allergic rhinitis is the one that does kind of take a little bit to get started. It's, it starts a little bit later, um, we think. And as you can see, it kind of hits its steep incline closer age five, six, seven. And unfortunately, allergic rhinitis is the most common one to last into adulthood. So once that kind of starts, that can be a hard one to kind of get rid of. We know that about 50% of children who have eczema will go on um, to develop asthma um, and that uh, 33 percent of them will also go on to have food allergy. We also know that children who have eczema are at risk of developing allergic rhinitis. Food allergies in children are also at a risk factor for allergic rhinitis and asthma. So all of these things tend to overlap um, and once they start they can be kind of hard to, to get on top of again. So how does allergy actually start? What is the process? At least with regards to allergic rhinitis. This is a kind of a busy slide but I think it goes through it pretty well. So the first step in developing allergies, you have the allergy sensitization phase. So what happens is, is you're exposed to the allergen, usually obviously through the nasal mucosa. That takes it up, the antigen or the, you know, the allergen pollen, whatever it is, um, and it is taken in by an antigen presenting cell. That antigen presenting cell then breaks it down and presents it to T cells. At this time, they're considered naive T cells. They haven't decided like what kind of T cell they're gonna be. Um, but with this um, allergic response, they kind of turn into this Th1 and Th2 helper response, which causes them to release the pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, IL-4, IL-3. Those cytokines then cause the B cells to turn into plasma cells that make antibodies, and the plasma cells in this case make IgE, and the IgE is what we know is implicated in starting off the allergy. So at this point, then you have IgE being made and it's binding to the mast cells, so the mast cells are kind of ready to go next time you see that allergen. So that's how the allergy sort of starts. 
The next time you see that allergen, we kind of move over towards the right side of the screen, um, and you have two phases of the allergic response. There's a primary reaction phase, which happens really quickly. That's the one, you know, immediate response. That antigen comes back in. Um, it gets broken down again so that that mast cell now with the IgE coding it can then just sort of automatically be activated. Um, mast cells and basophils then will release all their mediators like histamine, um, serotonin, leukotrienes, and you end up getting allergic rhinitis. So um, ultimately, you have mucus gland stimulation with secretions to cause the rhinorrhea. You have your sensory nerve stimulation to cause the sneezing and the itching. Basal dilation causes you to have nasal congestion and pressure in the nose and the sinuses. And then you have increased um, vascular permeability that causes ultimately uh, tissue edema. In the secondary reaction phase, um, because you've had, this is even independent of the persistence of the antigen, but because you've had the primary reaction phase, all of those originally released mediators that we talked about recruit other kind of like stronger immune system cells to the area, like the neutrophils and um, eosinophils, macrophages, and then those become activated and release their mediators. So this whole process is perpetuated. Um, so that's sort of how allergy happens. It's a little bit complicated, but you know, that it kind of makes itself worse as time goes on. So I will be referencing this article pretty frequently. It's the um, American Academy of Otolaryngology Clinical Practice Guideline on Allergic Rhinitis. It came out in 2015, so this is how we frame a lot of our management of allergy and allergic rhinitis. Um, this article, def just as an overall definition of what we consider allergic rhinitis, you can see here. It's basically, it has to be an issue caused by IgE-mediated inflammation, like we talked about, in the nasal mucosa, uh, mucous membranes due to a, an exposure to an inhaled allergen. And the symptoms that are related to this are the rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, itching, and sneezing. So that's what allergic rhinitis is by definition. Um, allergic rhinitis can be seasonal, it can be all year long, it can be intermittent, which is if it's less than four days per week or um, less than four weeks per year. It can be persistent, which is more than that. Um, and then it can also be episodic. So if you're in a situation, you know, you know you're allergic to cats, you go to someone's house who has a cat, you get allergic rhinitis, but that's the only time that happens. That is still allergic rhinitis, but it's considered episodic. So allergic rhinitis has a big implication on multiple factors um, throughout, you know, quality of life and day to day in people who have this. So um, these charts are from the paper cited at the bottom. It was um, basically a paper that worked by surveys to determine the burden of allergic rhinitis in kids. Um, the top chart there is basically trying to show what the most common symptoms are. And you know, red is every day, orange is most days. And as you can see, it's a lot of times the issue is with the nose. So nasal congestion is the most common, sneezing, runny nose. Those are the things that people have most of the time. But then on the bottom, you can see what is considered most bothersome, either extremely bothersome versus moderately bothersome. And again, it's, it's the nose. It's nasal congestion, post-nasal drip, runny nose. Um, obviously, a lot, all of these things are at least moderately bothersome. <laughs> so nothing is like slightly bothersome. But um, the things that seem to bother people the most is their nasal symptoms. And it has impacts also, not just on how they feel, but also cognitive function, their productivity. Um, that same paper put that chart up number E that shows that kids who had allergies accomplished less, um, they cut down on the amount of work and activity they took on, they had difficulty in their performance and the things they did start to do. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see here that kids who had rhinitis and rhinitis type symptoms as compared to those who were asymptomatic, basically did less activity, didn't sleep as well, they had lack of self-satisfaction. So it really does have a big implication on quality of life, um, you know, if it goes kind of unmanaged and untreated. So I think it's pretty important. So when you have a kid who comes in with a concern for allergic rhinitis, these are the things that our academy says we should basically look for and ask about. Um, so presenting symptoms, again, I think the first thing they'll always say is they sound always very congested. No matter what we do, their nose is full, it's congested. They may have sneezing, um, they may have drainage. In allergic rhinitis, the thing we're looking for is more of a clear drainage. Um, color drainage might suggest something else. You can have that in allergic rhinitis, but typically um, if it's colored or opaque, you there's some other things we think about um, in addition to the allergic rhinitis.
itching of the nose, postnasal drip, throat clearing. Cough is something also that can be a presenting symptom with just allergic rhinitis, um, and we'll talk about that in a, another paper too. Malaise is something that's common, and fatigue also is common. Malaise and fatigue are more unique to children. That's not as common in adults who are coming in with allergic rhinitis. Um, on history, we always want to ask about the nature of it. Is it seasonal, all year round? Um, is it due to a certain exposure? What medicines are on? What medicines they've tried? What has helped? What has not helped? Um, is there a family history? We know that atopic a to P runs in families. So um, if parents or somebody or siblings have really strong allergy, then it's very, it makes it more likely that that kid will have it too. And then I'll talk about a little bit of exam coming forward. So the clear drainage, like we talked about, you look for eye findings, allergic shiners, watery eyes, that nasal crease, that allergic salute from itching the nose. Um, and then I always want to make sure, you know, they don't have another reason to have drainage in their nose, like some, something that shouldn't be up there. Um, so when we talk about the physical exam, the one thing that, in addition to all of those other things that we look for really, oh sorry, I just touched this, um, we look for really specifically in ENT is we look at the turbinates. Um, so you might remember that the turbinates are these structures on the outside wall of the nose. They're on both sides. They have a, there's a bone and then they're covered in mucosa. Um, there's three of them on each side and they kind of act like the first line of defense in the nose. They act to humidify the nose, but they can also, they have a little bit of a filtration property as well. Um, so if you're allergic to something, they kind of get hit really hard, really fast usually, because <laughs> they are the first thing seeing the allergen. Um, so if you look here on the left side of the screen, this is looking in the left nasal cavity. You see the septum there. I don't know if my, this is the septum here. And then this here is the turbinate. Um, this is the inferior turbinate, that's the middle turbinate. So you see here that the mucosa is pink, it's normal, healthy looking, it doesn't look swollen, it doesn't look edematous or anything. And then you can also see here, whoops, sorry, I looked at my this screen, not that screen. This is the nasal airway, so you can see it's nice and open. Um, there's no drainage or anything. Over here on the right, if you compare this turbinate to that turbinate, that turbinate is a lot like more pale, we say, maybe bluish in color sometimes. It doesn't look as, it looks a little bit more full. It looks a little bit swollen. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can see the nasal airway is reduced in this case, but sometimes you'll see the turbinate coming all the way over and touching the septum, in which case you, you know, you don't really have any nasal airway there. So this is a, 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 a good example of what an allergic turbinate might look like. So then the question becomes, you know, how early or how young can you develop allergic rhinitis symptoms? Um, so this was a, it was a little bit of an older paper. It's from like the early 2000s, um, looking at allergic rhinitis and ATP in kids in South Africa. Um, they had a bunch of people enrolled. It was over 700 and they followed them over eight and a half years. And they evaluated them by questionnaires, some imaging, skin prick testing, and then blood testing. What they found was that um, significant rhinitis was noted in almost 80% of them. Um, and this paper, interestingly, their median age of onset was six months. 30% um, of them had rhinitis at infancy. I don't know if it was technically like allergic rhinitis, so I think there's a, a difference there, but you can have symptoms of rhinitis very early. Um, what they considered symptomatic rhinitis was nasal obstruction, drainage, itching, sneezing. And you can see on the right here, um, the chart basically depicting the rates at, of how severe it was by different age groups. Every age group looks like the majority of them had moderate um, disease, but you can see here that the highest number with moderate was actually newborns. So they, yeah, go ahead. Are you, oh, I thought you had was a question. All, what, what population was this? It was 78% seemed really high. It seems super was it high. Like going to an ENT clinic because of symptoms? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it is a little bit skewed, but I think that they're, um, the point is that you can have kids who come in very early, like earlier than I think we typically think of on that atopic march with concern for possible allergic rhinitis. Um, this paper is one of those like landmark papers in the world, I think, of at least ENT allergy. It's the Paris um, birth cohort. So they started off with about 3,500 children at birth. All of them were healthy, normal, full term, normal weight, no twins, like everything normal. Um, and they followed them for the first 18 months. And they questioned them about allergic rhinitis regarding sneezing, runny nose, congestions, independent of being sick. And they also did um, blood testing.
And what they found, I think this is maybe more realistic, more of like a 10, 9%, 10% of them ended up with allergic rhinitis symptoms. Um, and again, the most common thing here was the runny nose, but they, a lot of them had sneezing, congestion, and then watery eyes with nasal symptoms. They counted not just watery eyes, but with nasal symptoms. Um, interestingly, on the right side, um, they found that infants who had allergic rhinitis symptoms didn't really have increased prevalence of wheezing compared to those without, but they did see a significant difference between having this dry cough. So I think just a point again, when you have a young kid with this persistent dry cough and we don't know what it's coming from and maybe they're a little too young to have asthma, it could be allergy. Um, that was something I learned. This is like the biggest one I found. This um, was from 2016. It was a um, epidemiology paper and it included almost 30,000 kids in the U.S. looking to see the incidence of um, eczema, asthma, allergic rhinitis, al like all allergy stuff. And basically um, what they found is on table two is looking up until age five or so. And they found here that 17% of kids overall, you know, from birth to 59 months, or we're gonna develop allergy, but the peak age range within the young age time frame up until age five was between age like two and three. So um, around here is when it kind of peaks. So they're saying under a year is pretty uncommon to have the allergic rhinitis. Um, overall, in all kids, if you look over here, they go up until age 17. Incidence is similar at almost 20%, but the peak over here is gonna be more towards like age six to 10. So even more so than this first three years, the real peak of this is ages six to 10. But you can have it as early as like two or three is kind of when it starts, okay? Um, this slide is just trying to show the relationship between developing asthma or rhinitis in the setting of having had food allergies. So again, a point to how these things are all kind of related. Um, so if you had food allergy, 35% of them went on to develop asthma, and similarly, 35% of them went on to develop allergic rhinitis. So it can be like a, a sign of what might be coming if they develop a food allergy. So then the question is, you know, when, when should we do allergy testing? Um, so this was a paper, an, an older paper again, but it was a prospective study trying to look at when kids are showing signs of being sensitized by allergy testing. Um, so they had 200 or so kids and they looked at them almost every year until age six. Um, and so you can see on the left hand side is sensitization to food allergens and you can see that that happens, it peaks very early and then kind of slopes down as they get older. So some of them obviously we know can grow out of it. Um, but then in the middle and on the right are what they call the arrow allergens or the inhaled allergens. The middle one, B, is they only tested two outside allergens, um, and then the right side is inside allergens. And what you can see is that basically there was the incidence of sensitization increased with age. And particularly with the outside allergens, it happens after their third birthday is when they kind of really take off in terms of what, um, when they'll become more reactive with the outside allergens. Inside allergens were similar in that they kind of did say they went up over time, but the big difference here um, was with outside ones after age three or so. Um, this was a paper trying to see if kids who had already developed asthma symptoms might be more likely to have sensitization patterns earlier. So if you have a kid who's looking like they have asthma and they're younger than three, should you still allergy test them? Um, so they were looking at kids all under the age of two and they were um, medium age of 1.2 years. And they, you can see all the allergens they tested here, they're all, um, none of them are food allergens. And what you can see here ultimately is the sensitization rates were pretty low for both inside and outside allergens. So ultimately, you know, again, this paper is arguing that under age two, probably not gonna get a great yield on doing allergy testing. But overall, the data is mixed. There are papers for doing early allergy testing. There are papers against doing early allergy testing. I don't think there's a, a perfect answer. Um, you know, our guidelines say that you can technically do skin testing at any age, but you have to be mindful of the fact that in infants and young kids, their wheels might be smaller and their positive controls might look like their negative controls, which makes it all kind of, it can be in, indeterminate. Um, so ours say that you shouldn't really do allergy testing really probably until at least two youngest. 
Um, but I still think that might be, I think that might be a little early. This was a review paper by actually one of my attendings in Dallas, um, Dr. Veeling, who primarily does pediatric allergy now. Um, and she basically says her thoughts, she always said like you don't do allergy testing before age four. So I think somewhere maybe three might be the earliest where you might get some good data, but really four or five is probably more commonly where people start doing skin prick testing in kids. So what are the types of allergy testing? Um, obviously the goals of allergy testing are to confirm your suspicion that a child is allergic um, and then to try to figure out what exactly they're allergic to. Um, and also, in addition to confirming that they have allergy, we want to figure out how allergic they are to those things. So those are like the three main goals. All three of those can be accomplished with the in vivo testing, meaning like skin prick testing. Um, not as easy to do this with the blood testing, but um, we'll talk about that next. So this again is from our guidelines about the types of allergy testing. So as we mentioned, skin prick testing, there's two main types. Shown here on the right is the skin prick testing. So you have these little cassettes. They have little points on the end of those little arms there. Um, you dunk that whole tray into um, different allergens on each spot. And then you put that onto the skin. It pricks into the skin. And you end up getting like this baby has underneath. Um, I think this was a good example because if you look here on the bottom right, see how they're positive and negative don't look that different? So that's, a, that's an example of one that you know, you're know you testing. You can tell what's definitely positive, but you can't necessarily tell what's negative in that sense. Um, so that's why I think doing it younger can be harder. But that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the wheels, and you measure the size of the wheels compared to the controls. Um, the other, so that's the skin prick testing. It allows you to basically give a good sense of how much they're reacting to something. Um, it's considered more sensitive than the blood testing because you get kind of real in time re, um, reactive information. If you have something that's indeterminate or you think a child is really sensitive to something but they're not really showing, it's unclear on the skin prick testing, you can do intradermal testing. That's more like, a, it feels like a PPD. Um, it goes in the dermis there and so you get basically more exposure to the, the blood than you would from just a skin prick testing. So you theoretically should have a stronger response. Um, the problem with doing either of these skin tests are that they can lead you to have a really bad allergic reaction and potentially anaphylaxis. Um, and also there are some meds that you have to stop ahead of time. So I, and I have a list of that coming up. Um, blood testing is safe in that there's no risk of anaphylaxis. You can be on any of the medicines that are not affected by the medicines. You're really testing for IgE levels. Um, this is what you have to do this in a kid who has dermatographism or who has really severe eczema because you can't do the skin prick testing in those cases. Um, but the problem is that sometimes you get false positives on the skin, on the blood test. So for example, you can have a kid who comes back as having like a terrible grass allergy or something on their blood work, but they just played soccer yesterday and they were totally fine and their allergy symptom is in the winter or their season is winter. So you kind of, you don't always know what to make of that. Um, so I think that's why technically we usually prefer the skin prick testing, but um, if you have to, obviously blood testing is fine. Um, they don't recommend doing the IgE levels, IgG levels anymore, and then there's some of these other like funky things like acoustic rhinometry, which um, they don't recommend. So it's usually either skin, some type of skin test or blood work. <coughs> mm -hmm. Do you get false positives with the skin test? You can. Um, I think it's a lot less likely to get false positives with the skin test. Um, but similarly, like you would expect, for example, if you have those IgE circulating that come up on the blood work, that you might have them come up also on skin prick testing, but I think it's a lot less likely. Okay. Um, and I think the other thing, too, is it has to come, you ha have to take like the clinical history about like when their season is, yeah, you know? about that same scenario you said about the grass. Yeah. I was wondering if you see that same I think you, you can see it, but I think it's a lot less okay. common. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is, it's more like, I don't know what the word is, realistic, I guess, in that says, huh? Reliable? Yeah, yeah, it's more reliable, and I think it also is just more um, genuine to what they're actually is feeling and, and like having happen. Your um, previous study that said sterile allergen mm -hmm. allergy testing, that was the skin prick skin test? Mm -hmm. test. Those were skin tests. Mm -hmm. Um, so these are the medicines that if you're going to do skin prick testing, you're supposed to hold off on. So red is stop, green is go. <laughs> so those are fine. Um, so interestingly, any antihistamine 
H1, like the obviously allergy meds, but also retinidine, H2 blockers, you have to stop beforehand. Um, other topical antihistamines, if you have eye drops that are have antihistamines in them or a nasal antihistamine that has to be stopped. Um, TCAs have to be stopped as well because they have antihistamine properties. Um, also, you cannot be using topical corticosteroids on the area that's going to be used for skin prick testing. So I think if you're, you know, if you have a rash like on your belly or something, but you're getting skin prick tested on your arm, that could be okay, but you can't put the antihistamine on the area that's going to have the skin prick testing. You can take systemic steroids. That's the green one. It's interesting. It's bizarre. Um, I don't fully also understand like why that is. I think it would make sense that you couldn't, but you can. I think it has to do with the fact that the systemic uh, steroids don't necessarily impact your antibody levels. They work more so on your neutrophil reactivity and stuff like that. So I think for that reason it's okay, but that's just my, that's what I think. I'm not totally sure. Um, and interestingly, if they're, if they're on Montelukast, they can keep taking that. Um, so those are the main ones I think that probably kids are on regularly um, to think about. So if a test is negative, like say for example you do this early and it comes up with nothing, like is it worth doing again later? Like does this change over time? Um, so this was a study, it was a worldwide study about, it was the phase three of the international study on asthma and allergies. Um, so worldwide, pretty big study, included over 500,000 kids. Um, and they basically looked across the world and gave a questionnaire twice. So it was at age six to seven, and then again at 13 and 14. So when they were basically twice as old. Um, basically what they found is that um, about eight and a half percent of the kids who were younger had positive symptoms of allergy, and then that almost doubled when they were 13 and 14. So the incidence of allergy um, tended to increase with age. Similarly, this was another paper looking to assess the predictive value of positive skin prick testing early on on allergic symptoms into adulthood. So they had 200 kids followed for the 20 years, which is amazing that they kept that many of them that long. <laughs> Um, but they did skin prick testing at 5, 11, and 20. And what you can see here on the bottom um, is that the skin prick testing positives, um, the percentage of those went up every instance um, and every time point, as did the allergic symptoms. Um, so within this cohort, even kids became more allergic over time. What they found is that the people who had a positive skin prick test at five years old, that same allergen remained positive all subsequent times. The difference um, was that new sensitivities developed over time. So once they were positive for that at five, it stayed positive, but they found new ones um, as they tested when they were older. So what they found up here is that um, in terms of how well the five-year one did to relate to the 20-year testing, in terms of um, any allergic symptom, it still had a significant association, especially when you look at um, respiratory symptoms in particular, that was significant. Um, but what they also showed was that 77% of patients who had allergic symptoms at age 20 had originally been negative at age five. So um, I think it just shows that people develop allergies a little bit older maybe than age five. And as you get, as you go along, you can be sensitized to more things and then you become potentially more allergic. So that's sort of what they're trying to show over here. You can see that this, these are the different things that they tested for. Um, and the dark black bar is five years testing, and then the gray bar is 11 years, and the dark gray bar is 20 years. And you can see that most of them had the highest incidence at age 20. So new sensitivities over time. But I think the main thing is once you're positive for something at five, that stayed positive. So how do we treat allergies in children? Um, there are three main categories. Um, avoidance, which may or may not be possible. <laughs> also doesn't really work that well. Um, there's pharmacotherapy, which is the first line treatment. And pretty much everybody will need some type of allergy medicine forever, probably, or at some point. Um, and then the last option is immunotherapy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And immunotherapy is really the only one that can potentially be curative, but it's a really big commitment. Um, and we'll talk about that too. So in terms of 
avoidance. Um, they have shown that if you are able to be successful in your avoidance measures, that that does reduce the allergen levels in your environment, but that doesn't always translate to reduction in symptoms. Um, obviously, if you have one of those allergies that is specific to one type of animal or pet and you get rid of that pet, then that does work. But if you wash that pet, you do end up reducing their allergen level, but that doesn't actually affect your symptoms. So um, some of these things work better than others, but ultimately I think this can be a huge challenge and most people are not super able to, to do this totally successfully. Um, this is a busy slide, and I'm gonna zoom in on this part of it. Um, these are all of our guidelines basically in one table. When it comes to treatment, um, our guidelines say that we should recommend intranasal steroids for anyone who has a diagnosis with allergic rhinitis and the symptoms affect their quality of life. As we've talked about, they pretty much 100% of the time will affect the quality of life <laughs> and can affect the quality of life in multiple different arenas. So I think most people will start with a intranasal steroid. Um, and we'll talk about oral antihistamines, intranasal histamine, antihistamines, and leukotriene receptors. Another one that I want to mention here is the International Consensus Statement on Allergy and Rhinology. Um, this updated one came out in 2018, so it's another one that we go by pretty regularly. Um, it's a really long paper, but um, when it talks about pharmacotherapy, they say that basically medications are the primary modality for control of allergic symptoms. So multiple societies talking about allergy recommend giving them some type of allergy medicine as first line. So we recommend doing intranasal corticosteroids as first line treatment. How do these work? Um, they really work to reduce the mediator cytokine release and they, so that is talking about that um, the first phase, the early phase of allergy that we talked about earlier, that they kind of can help reduce that. Um, they also inhibit recruitment of those strong inflammatory cells to the nasal mucosa, so that's that prolonged or second phase of the allergy that we talked about. So they can kind of work on both ends of the allergic response. Um, they also reduce the hyper-responsiveness of the nasal mucosa, therefore like raising the threshold before they're going to release histamine. So they kind of work in, in a lot of the ways that allergy happens. They work really well. Um, they work to reduce congestion, sneezing, itching, rhinitis, basically all of the symptoms of allergic rhinitis. And they do so also by um, reducing the nasoocular reflex. We know that you know, if you think about when you sneeze and your nose is really bothering you, sometimes your eyes get watery. That's because we have this reflex through the nose and the eyes, so they work on that too. Um, between, like, in terms of which one to pick, they have all been shown to be equal and um, same efficacy, but I think probably the way I make my decision is based on how old the kid is and what's approved, what's FDA approved, so I have a chart for that in a minute. What are the side effects? Usually the main thing is that they get local irritation in the nose. Um, one thing I think is interesting is I've had a few kids come to see me recently for nosebleeds and it sounds like someone told them that they should use like Flonase for the nosebleed, but actually Flonase can cause a nosebleed. So that was interesting um, and they were funny about it. But basically I think nosebleeds is probably the most common thing I see. And sometimes that can be helped, but by how they're actually applying the medication. So I have a picture of that next. Um, and so sometimes we can, we can work on that and get by that. There's not been any adverse effects proven in terms of if it, you know, having steroids long-term from the nose actually will impact your hypothalamic pituitary axis. That's not been proven. The one thing that has been shown, um, but the data is kind of not fully clear on this, is its effect on growth. Um, so they have been shown if they're using them long term to ha to potentially have an issue with their short term growth, um, but I think if they stop it, typically that growth tends to catch up. So in terms of like a long term issue on growth, that has not been super well defined, but it is something to take note of if you have a kid who's on it for a long time and you feel like they're not maybe growing appropriately, it might be worth taking them off it and um, seeing seeing if that helps. So how to use it, um, basically we know that the part of the nose that it works on are those turbinates on the outside wall of the nose that we talked about earlier. So I always tell people to try to aim the bottle towards the eye on the same side. 
So in an older kid who's doing it themselves, I try to tell them to use the opposite hand to the side they're gonna spray because it kind of inherently like aims the bottle out a little bit better. Um, we know, but you know, in younger kids, we tell the parents that. Um, we know that it takes at least two weeks for this to really kick in and make a difference. The reason for that is that the spray is thought to not really be systemically absorbed and it really is very localized. Uh, but with that, it's a fairly low dose per spray. So it takes a little bit to build up to be a therapeutic level in the nasal mucosa. Um, we also know that if a patient has seasonal allergic rhinitis, we recommend that they start using this before that season hits um, just to try to prevent that whole reaction. So at least a couple of days, I usually tell them at least a week or two before that season. Um, and again, we're trying to aim away from the septum. So this is a chart, sorry, it's, I guess it's smaller over here than I thought it would be, but um, trying to s basically show the age at which different sprays, intranasal corticosteroid sprays are approved by the FDA. So the youngest one <laughs> is Nasocort and Nasonex are two years and older. Um, and the dose for that, but up to age five, is one spray on each side a day, and then as they are over six, it can be two sprays on each side. So in the young kids, it's one spray per side per day. Um, Flonase, interestingly, is not approved until age four. Um, that is something that I think not a lot of us know about. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I haven't. Used yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't. It's used all the time, and nothing bad has happened. Um, but technically, it, it is. A, and or has not been studied, but um, so it happens all the time, but just as, a, as an aside, it's not technically approved until age four. But that being said, we use it all the time. And a lot of times I'll write for Nasonex and insurance says they can't do it or whatever, so they end up on Flonase anyway. Um, here are the oral antihistamines. So these I think are something that we can start much earlier if we're concerned about allergy. Um, Zyrtec and Zizol and Clarinex are each approved at six months of age. Um, so I usually use Zyrtec. I think most people are familiar with Zyrtec. Most parents may even have it at home already. Um, interestingly, Claritin is not approved until age two. So it's a little bit older in that setting. Um, so therefore, I tend to just use Zyrtec and I have them give it at night because it can be a little bit sedating. Um, but if you are concerned that they might be having allergies and things like that, and they're younger than the two years old that you can start a spray, I oftentimes will start um, Zyrtec. And then these are just a comment on the intranasal um, antihistamines. So the most common one is Astelin um, right here. Um, this one is approved once they're age six. And so this is something that um, there's a chart sort of at the end here that talks about like how you can add these things together. But sometimes if you have a kid who's been on an intranasal steroid and it's not really doing it for them, then sometimes I'll add Astelin if they're old enough. That The combination seems to work really well together. Oh, here's that thing. So here's what our guidelines recommend on how to do allergy treatment. Um, they recommend doing the intranasal steroid as a monotherapy first. Um, if you don't have adequate control of the symptoms, they say that you can add an intranasal antihistamine, like that um, acetylene that we talked about. They say you can do um, Afrin for a few days. I think the point there is to try, in addition to the Flonase, I think the reason is to try to like kick them, like get them kick-started, like get them feeling like you're doing something <laughs> and that it's working so that they'll stick with it. They don't recommend adding an oral antihistamine or a leukotriene receptor antagonist for the purposes of nasal symptoms. It's not been shown that the pills really work well on the nasal congestion and the nasal symptoms. They work better for the more systemic symptoms like itching, itchy throat, itchy eyes, that kind of stuff, but doesn't really work super well for the nasal symptoms. Um, and then, you know, basically if you're gonna, if they're younger or whatever and you wanna start the oral antihistamine but you don't get control of symptoms, they say to, you can add an oral decongestant briefly um, this is kind of a weird pathway. I don't think I've seen many people do this. I think ultimately, though, the main point is they say don't add the intranasal steroid because either you're going to do, you're, if you do, then you're going to move to the intranasal steroid pathway. You're not going to stay with the combo. And then in terms of an intranasal antihistamine, you can use those as monotherapy, but again, if that's not enough, then you add the intranasal steroid. So ultimately, they tend to kind of all funnel back to the intranasal steroid if you can, I think is the main point.
One thing they don't talk about in our guidelines though is saline. Um, and I think obviously saline is great. We love saline. Everybody should use saline probably. Um, saline is not really a med. You can't be too young for saline. And um, there's been a lot of really, really good evidence that it works to help allergic rhinitis in adults, but especially children. So on the left here, this is that chart from that um, international forum guideline that we talked about from 2018, the international one. And there's a ton of research showing that saline is helpful in kids. Um, one thing that they do suggest potentially is that hypertonic solution might be more effective than isotonic solution. The reason for that, well, there's twofold. So I think the way saline works is twofold. The first is that it acts like a shower and just flushes out all of the allergens from the nose. So you're reducing the allergy burden. But especially with the hypertonic solution, it kind of acts through osmosis to pull fluid out of the mucosa and cause it to shrink that way. So in and of itself, it can be a decongestant. So um, I try to put everybody on saline, honestly. I take, I pick my battles, like if you're only gonna get one, I'll pick the steroid, but um, if you have a compliant kid and a compliant mom and they really are determined to get this better, I'll do the saline as well. If you're gonna start saline, you just have to remind them to do saline first, because otherwise you wash out the medicine. <laughs> which it makes sense when someone tells you that, but until someone does, sometimes you're like, oh yeah. So saline has to be first. Other meds that you can use for allergy, there is pseudoephedrine, um, chromalin nasal spray is a mast cell stabilizer, so it should theoretically block the degranulation in that early phase. Um, it's really hard to use though, because you have to use it three or four times a day to work, so I, and most people don't use it. Um, Ipatropium is atrovent, and then Montelukast, like we talked about, you can, you can use that as an adjunct, but it shouldn't be used on its own. So which of these actually work? Um, we have found that intranasal steroids, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear me say, work the best <laughs> for most of the symptoms, if not all of them. Um, oral antihistamines are pretty good for those more systemic symptoms, like we talked about, nasal itching, sneezing, not as good for congestion, though. Um, Intranasal antihistamines are kind of the second best when it comes to the allergic rhinitis symptoms. They have two pluses instead of one. And then the leukotriene receptor antagonists there are kind of the least effective. And so they basically should not be the only thing someone is using for allergy. Um, obviously, if a kid has um, like asthma or something, there's other reasons to use them, but they shouldn't necessarily be used alone for allergy. So now a brief touch on immunotherapy. So it's pretty involved. So if a patient presents to you, this is like a decision tree about when to or to not consider immunotherapy. And I think a lot of people end up falling into the no immunotherapy bucket um, just because there's a lot that goes into it. So if someone comes to you with allergic rhinitis and all the symptoms, um, then you need to confirm that they have evidence of an IgE mediated issue. So they need some type of allergy testing to confirm that. If the testing doesn't show that, then they shouldn't get aller they shouldn't get immunotherapy. Um, but if it does, then you have to have a really in-depth discussion with the family about the risks, the benefits, the commitment that it takes that we'll talk about. And if the family's not on board with that, then you shouldn't go forward with it. Um, if it is, if they are though, and um, immunotherapy is recommended, then you need to get like a really we need to get a really formal like informed consent process because again, it's it's pretty involved, and it has some real risks. Um, and if so, then we move on to do immunotherapy. So again, prerequisites for immunotherapy, they have to have IgE-mediated allergy, um, and then their allergic symptoms have to correlate to their testing. So like we were talking about in those kids who may have something on their blood work, but they don't actually have symptoms of that, you wouldn't give them immunotherapy for that because it's not actually affecting them day to day. Um, and you also have to have proven that pharmacotherapy and everything has not been sufficient. So what is it approved for? It's approved for allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, atopic dermatitis, if they also have an aeroallergen sensitivity. So I think atopic dermatitis in and of itself isn't, but if you also have some nasal allergy and aeroallergens, you can. Um, allergic conjunctivitis, and then some um, bee stings and insect stings. Um, it's sort of under investigation for food hypersensitivity and oral allergy syndrome. Um, Right now, it is not indicated for kids who just keep, like, who get hives, and we don't know why. Um, those kids are not, that's not a reason to do immunotherapy, um, angioedema, asthma that's not allergy related or due to IgE, um, emphysema, drug reactions also are not reasons to do immunotherapy.
So both our guidelines and that international consensus statement guidelines do recommend immunotherapy in children. Um, it's been, the main things I think that we'll also talk about here that I thought was very interesting is that if you treat someone for allergic rhinitis with immunotherapy, it can delay or prevent them from progressing to developing asthma, which I think can be pretty big <laughs> for kids. Um, so it is approved for, ki for kids. Um, what are the complete, like total contraindications to doing immunotherapy? So if you have poorly controlled or uncontrolled asthma, that's an absolute contraindication. If you have partially controlled asthma, that's a relative contraindication, but I think typically we want the asthma to be legit well controlled. Um, autoimmune disorders, if they're active, that is an absolute contraindication. But if, it's a, if they're in remission, that's a relative contraindication to um, allergy immunotherapy for the aeroallergens. And then I also circled children below five years of age. Um, I tried to box the ones that I feel like we run into most frequently in kids. Um, so basically, absolute contraindication if they're under age of two. Um, between two and five, it's more of a relative contraindication. So I think it, it's case by case basis if they're under five, but over five, it is okay pretty much in anybody who doesn't have any of these other factors going on. So most kids, I think, and I think part of that too is um, they have to be old enough to like let you do the allergy therapy, you know, and be okay with it. <laughs> oh yeah. Based on one of the previous slides that we were mm -hmm. talking about, if you had a positive allergy test of five and then you were testing, mm -hmm. you would stay positive for that same allergen, but mm -hmm. then you add others. Mm -hmm. If you get allergy um, um, immunotherapy at, let's say seven, or yeah. what you're allergic to at that point in time, mm -hmm. you, what are the chances that- It will be helpful to prevent you. Exactly. They've shown that it can. So right. basically, the and. I think in a minute I have a, yeah, this slide talks about how it works and I think that that's why it works for that. Um, so that's a great question. But yes, they have shown that if you treat the allergy early with immunotherapy, you, you're ultimately like altering the way the immune system responds to stuff. So in that way you can, you just become less allergic. So it does work. Um, so when we talk about it's considering immunotherapy, these are the things we have to discuss with the family. So there is a big risk of anaphylaxis with the allergy treatment because you're actually giving them a shot of their allergen. So that can put them into anaphylaxis, so that's dangerous. So they have to know how to and be okay with using an EpiPen and know what to do should they have to use their EpiPen. Um, therapy is every week they have to come in for a shot and they have to come in for three to five years every week for a shot. It's a big deal. So um, they have to basically be okay with that big commitment. Um, and you have to set real expectations. You know, this is the only option that we have that can be considered potentially curative for allergy, um, but it may not be permanent. So you can get new sensitizations over time, but they have shown that they're less if you treat the allergy. So I don't think we understand it all the way, to be honest. The immune system is kind of a big black box still, but. Um, they have shown that you reduce allergens and its sensitivities, but you still can get them. So, but usually you won't be sensitive to what you were treated for already. So it, it's, I think it's still helpful. So how does it work? This is another complicated slide. Ultimately, what immunotherapy does is it works on the two different parts of the um, allergic response that we talked about. So the first thing that it does is if you remember in the early phase of the allergy, you have the naive T cell that kind of pushes itself towards the Th1 and Th2 response. That's like the pro-allergic response. Um, by doing immunotherapy, you actually change the proportion of Th1 to Th2 while also increasing your T regulatory cells. So your T regulatory cells are the ones that kind of suppress the immune response. So you're increasing the T regulatory cells while also reducing your Th1 and Th2 proportions. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing you're doing is, if you remember, we are in allergy, you're making a lot of IgE. Um, using immunotherapy induces production of IgG4 um, antibody, which can basically break down the IgEs, so you end up reducing your proportion of IgE, so your IgE to IgG4 levels change with a, basically you get more IgG4, uh, and those can help like prevent that allergic response. So it does sort of alter how your immune system is functioning. 
Um, so it's pretty cool. It's pretty complicated though, but that's like my level of understanding of how this works. And it does seem to work. Um, so there's two types of immunotherapy. There's subcutaneous immunotherapy and sublingual immunotherapy. Um, both have been shown to be effective for allergic rhinitis. Um, they're, I mean, they're fairly safe as well. Subcutaneous has been around for longer and has been better studied. So they have had one per 2.5 million injections cause of death, but none so far with sublingual. Um, the rate of systemic reactions is similar. Um, difference in dosing, so the subcutaneous is the one where you have to come into the office every week to get a shot. Um, the sublingual ones are usually done at home. The first one, obviously, you do in the office to make sure that nobody you know, has a horrible reaction, but subsequently you can do them at home, so theoretically that's a little bit easier to keep up with. Um, right now, all subcutaneous immunotherapy is FDA approved, which means we can get it um, covered by insurance, which is great. Sublinguals, some stuff is FDA approved now. There's a few allergens. I think dust mite is one of them and certain um, like molds, I think, have a sublingual, um, but most of them are not yet approved. So because of that, it's hard, you, you know, we can't really get them covered and therefore they, that might be pro like prohibitive to patients using them at home, but they both work. Um, and then the PAT study, was another one of those landmark studies in allergy talking about how using um, immunotherapy can help prevent asthma. So um, the original study is shown here on the left and then the follow-up study is on the right. And basically their odds ratios are basically saying that their data was in favor of their hypothesis that using immunotherapy does prevent the development of asthma in children with allergies in the short term which was the first study, and then also again in the long term, after at least two years after stopping the immunotherapy. So once they had completed it, um, more people who had used it did not develop asthma. So A, it can prevent asthma, but then also it's been shown that if you treat the allergies in the context of asthma, the asthma gets better. Um, so there's a bunch of data about that and those papers are shown or some of them are shown here from that consensus statement. So I think for those reasons, if you have a kid who's like super allergic, nothing's working, we know what they're allergic to, and or you're worried they may or may not have asthma or they're gonna get asthma, it's reasonable to have them come to have a discussion about maybe needing to do immunotherapy. So ultimately, this is also smaller than I wanted it to be, and I'm sorry about that, but this is sort of the pathway that our, our academy recommends on how to manage this. So. Ultimately, if someone comes in with concern for allergic rhinitis and has all the right symptoms, um, we do our history and our exam, look for comorbidities, to decide if they need treatment, which pretty much always they will need treatment. Um, the first thing to try are the medicines. Um, you can always recommend environmental factors and avoidance. It's never wrong to say that, but it probably isn't going to do much. Um, and then if and or when those things aren't working well enough, you can go on to do allergy testing and then ultimately immunotherapy. Um, something else that ENTs do is we can do turbinate reductions, but that's irrelevant for right now. <laughs> um, and that's it. So thank you all for having me.